chemistry, or at least one of the, the one of the major concepts of chemistry, are things called atoms. And I gave a definition of atoms there. I said the smallest particles of ordinary matter. But let me begin by maybe saying it in a different, slightly different way. Uh, atoms are nature's Lego building blocks. And what the heck do I mean by that? Uh, well. Maybe when you were a kid, you played with Legos, where you can, you know, these little building blocks you can snap together to build stuff. And maybe some of the things you made out of your Lego building blocks were non-living things, like here's a Lego building of some sort or a Lego train. But you could also snap your Legos together to make living things, like Lego people or a Lego dog it was maybe one that I made as a kid. Well, no matter whether in your Lego universe you made a living thing like a Lego dog or a non-living thing like a Lego train, it's still made out of Lego building blocks. So you can say that Lego building blocks were the smallest particles, the smallest units uh, of everything you, you built in your Lego universe. Well, that's the way to think of atoms. In the real actual universe, everything you see is made of these little round building blocks called atoms. So it could be a living thing like your body or the trees out there or the birds, or it could be a non-living thing like this desk or these walls or the air itself. The smallest things, the building blocks of everything in the universe is these little round objects called atoms. Now, when you look at things in your Lego universe, you could see the building blocks of everything you made. You can't see the atoms. They're just too small. Even though this desk and my body is made out of atoms, you just can't possibly see them with your naked eye. Even if you had a really good microscope, you can't see atoms. They are just way, way uh, too tiny. But nevertheless, everything in the world is built out of atoms, just like the Lego building blocks that you see there. Um, now, um, even though you can't see the atoms that things are built out of, even with a really good microscope. Let's imagine you could. Let's imagine you had some super powerful microscope and you want to look at an object, let's say a household nail. So if you had this imaginary super microscope and you zoomed in closer and closer and closer on your nail through your microscope, if you could get close enough to it, zoom in close enough to it, you would eventually see that it was built out of atoms. And that's what I was trying to show in this, uh, this cartoon right here. Um, so that's the way to think of an atom. They are spheres. They are ball-shaped um, um, particles. Uh, now, uh, there are three things I want you to know about atoms. One of them I just mentioned, that they are ball-shaped, uh, uh, like little spheres. Another thing I want you to know about atoms is that they're very, very tiny. Um, I once did a, a rough calculation of how many atoms there are in just one little household nail. And let me come over here. You don't have to know this number. I promise I'm not going to ask you this on any quiz or midterm. Pardon me. But in just one little household nail, uh, these are how many atoms there are in there. Wow, so that should impress you. Uh, you know, uh, atoms must be very, very tiny if it takes that many of them just to, to, to make up a tiny little nail, right? Uh, so atoms are round, they're extremely small. And one last thing about them I want you to know is there's different types of atoms. Uh, you know, since I was talking about an iron nail, then it's made out of iron atoms, but there's a whole bunch of other different types of atoms. There are sodium atoms, there are carbon atoms, there are oxygen atoms, there are hydrogen atoms, uh, just to name a few. All right, there, there are over 100 types of atoms, and they are listed on what's called the periodic table of elements. Elements is, is another word for, uh, for atoms. Uh, there's one periodic table of elements here, but unfortunately, it doesn't actually give the names of any of the atoms. There's a second periodic table of elements there on the back wall. And if you look closely at it, it does actually name uh, each, each of the atoms. Now, um, we're going to be talking about atoms quite a bit uh, as we go through this class. Um, and sometimes when we're talking about a given atom type, like a carbon atom or a hydrogen atom, 
I'll just write out the name of that type of atom because that's its name. But there's also kind of an abbreviation for each atom's name called its atomic symbol. It, uh, the atomic symbol is always a one or two letter abbreviation that stands for that, the name of that atom. Uh, just to give an example, here on this periodic table you see that one of the atoms they represent with a C, that's carbon atom. Uh, and so we say that C is the atomic symbol for carbon atoms. And N, that stands for nitrogen atoms. So just a capital N is the atomic symbol for nitrogen atoms. So notice that all atomic symbols are one or two letters. You know, some of these are just a single letter and some of them are two letters. So the atomic symbol is always one or two letters. If it's just a single letter, it's always a capital letter. And if it's two letters, the first one's capital and the, the second one is always lowercase. Okay, well, I've got some good news and bad news for you. Um, the good news is that I want you to memorize the names of some of the atoms and their atomic symbols. And uh, is that the good news or the bad news? That's the bad news. The good news is you don't have to memorize all 110. There's just 12 of them that I do want you to memorize. And here they are in your lecture outlines. And I guess I don't have them on the pictures here, but I should have at least the, the, first, um, uh, the first four there. OK, so yes, I want you to know these. I want you to know that there's an, an element, an atom called carbon, and its atomic symbol is C. And I want you to know that there's an element called hydrogen, a type of atom called hydrogen, and its atomic symbol is H, uh, on, onward down this, uh, this list right here. Now, why am I having you memorize these 12? Because these are the ones that living things are built out of. You know, obviously your body is a living thing, and so these are the types of these are the atoms that you find inside your 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 body. Uh, this list of the atoms there is pretty much 100% of the atoms that, that you find inside inside your body. All right, and so uh, again, remember that the atomic symbol is always either one or two letters, um, and usually it's the first one or two letters of the of the, uh, the, uh, the atom's name. Like getting up here on this screen, for carbon atoms, the atomic symbol is a C. Uh, it helps you remember it. And likewise, for hydrogen atoms, the atomic symbol is H. And for oxygen, it's O. And for nitrogen, it's N. Or like calcium, where's calcium? Uh, there it is. Uh, its atomic symbol is CA, um, because those are the first two letters. Now, some of them don't really fit that pattern, like, so like sodium. Its atomic symbol is Na, and there's not even an N or an A in there. So you may wonder, well, why did that come? And for potassium, its atomic symbol is K. There's no K in the word potassium. So some of them, it's a little bit screwball. But for generally, uh, the, the atomic symbol is the first one or two letters of the, uh, of, of the atom's name. OK, and so I, I may ask you questions based on this concept on a quiz or a midterm. I might, on a quiz or a midterm, say, what is the atomic symbol for chlorine? And I expect you to say, Mr. Eden's at CL. Or I could ask the question backwards. I could say, one of the atomic symbols is CL. What, uh, what's the full name of that atom? And I expect you to say, Mr. Eden's, the answer is chlorine. So know these 12 uh, backwards and forwards, please. Oh, yeah, there's iron and magnesium. They're also on, on this list. Oh, let me go on a, a, a brief uh, sidetrack for a second. Uh, let me see something here. One second. There we go. When you look at these lecture outlines, in addition to the text, in the bottom right, I uh, write out where you can look up this information in the textbook. Um, so down here in the bottom right of each paragraph of text in the lecture outlines, it will either say table some, so so or like figure 5.3 or figure 10.7. Uh, so my, my goal there is, as you're reviewing your lecture notes, um, you'll be able to find figures and tables in the textbook that illustrate whatever that block of text is talking about. OK, but getting back to uh, where I was, I want you to know these 12 atoms and their uh, atomic symbols, please. OK. Uh, so. I think a few minutes ago I told you to think of atoms as Mother Nature's Legos because 
you know, everything around you is, is built out of atoms, just like everything when you were a kid is built out of Legos. Uh, now, Lego blocks are designed to click together with each other so you can build stuff out of them. That's the same with atoms. Atoms, or at least most atoms, have a natural tendency to stick together, to bond to each other, to form larger structures called molecules. Um, and so let me illustrate that. If we were to take one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms and put, their, put them near each other, they would automatically on their own come together, kind of stick together like this. Click. And this new structure, when you get atoms linked together, is called a molecule. So a molecule is a particle that's made out of atoms joined together. How many atoms? Well, this particular molecule has three atoms in it, obviously, but it might be just two. That still counts as a molecule of two atoms joined together. But it might be dozens or hundreds or even thousands or millions of atoms joined together. There really is no set number of atoms per molecule. It differs from one molecule to another. But a molecule is always, is always at least two atoms uh, joined together. Now notice in this picture of the molecule, you can see these red lines that are the connections between the atoms of the molecule, those are called covalent bonds. Uh, think of them as the glue that joins, that bonds the atoms together in a molecule. Now, the covalent bonds are obviously not actually made out of Elmer's glue. Uh, let's not worry about what they're made out of. Just know that they are uh, the, the, what links the atoms together in a molecule. OK, um, so here you see this kind of picture of you know, Who knows, what molecule is this? It's a, it's a water molecule. Yeah, some of you might recognize it. Um, sometimes when I'm talking about molecules, I will show you the molecule like this, where you will see the individual atoms kind of looking like little spheres and the uh, covalent bonds linking them. Um, sometimes, instead of sketching the atoms looking like spheres, I will just show their atomic symbols, right? And so be, be ready to see something like this and say, OK, that's a molecule, and it's made out of one oxygen and two hydrogen atoms, and those are the covalent bonds between them. And incidentally, when I show you a molecule in that way, where I kind of sketch it out, and you see the uh, atomic symbols of all the atoms and the covalent bonds linking them, that's called a molecular structure. So I'd say that this is a molecular structure of, of a water molecule. Um, in your lecture handout, and also on the screen here, here are some other molecular structures. Um, the, the oxygen that's in the air around us, oxygen gas, is actually made out of molecules of two oxygen atoms joined together by a covalent bond. Uh, there's water. We just saw that each water molecule is made out of one oxygen atom linked to two hydrogens like there. Um, ammonia is a molecule that your body makes as sort of a waste product. Uh, and that's the molecular structure of ammonia. It's made out of one nitrogen atom, three hydrogen atoms linked in that shape right there. Uh, carbon dioxide, that's, a, that's a, a waste gas that your body makes. Um, there you see its molecular structure. Notice that it's OK for there to be more than one covalent bond between the atoms. Uh, we call that a double bond. So in carbon dioxide, there's a double bond between the carbon and each of the two oxygens, like you see there and there. Uh, just think of that as more glue. The, uh, you know, the covalent bonds are like glue. So if you see a double bond, think of those atoms as being extra tightly uh, bonded together. All right, yeah, so when you see a molecule sketched out like that, where you see the bonds and all the atoms, uh, that's called a molecular structure. Now, sometimes when we're talking about molecules, there's a shorter way of representing the molecule than the molecular structure. And that shorter way of representing the molecule is called a molecular formula. Uh, and so I'll explain what these molecular formulas are, but let me just show them to you first. Here we go. So here's the molecular formula for this oxygen molecule. And here's the molecular formula for this ammonia molecule. Um, so let's talk about molecular formulas. So first of all, notice that molecular formulas don't show you the covalent bonds, right? The covalent bonds are the little lines linking the atoms. The, you don't put any covalent bonds when you're writing a molecular formula for a molecule. 
Um, so what does the molecular formula show? Well, it shows the atoms that are in that molecule, like a, uh, an ammonia molecule has one nitrogen and three hydrogens. To represent that there are three hydrogens, you put a little subscript three after the hydrogen symbol, after the hydrogen H, right? So the little subscript numbers tell you how many of an atom there are. Now, if there's only one of an atom, like there's only one nitrogen in ammonia, you don't write one. It's just understood that if there's no number after, the, after an atom, there's just one of it. Uh, and let's use this one over here. Uh, water molecules, here you see their molecular structure right here. Water molecules have two hydrogens and one oxygen. And so you have to put a little subscript two after the H in the molecular formula to say that there are two hydrogens. But you don't put a one after the O because there's, it's just understood. If there's no number, that there's just one. And likewise, carbon dioxide is made out of one carbon and two oxygens, so its molecular formula is CO2, with the two telling you that there's two oxygen atoms. All right, now I'm going to give you a chance to go from a molecular structure to a molecular formula. I'm going to click on the button here, and I'm going to show you a, a molecule and give you a few minutes, see if you can, maybe on a piece of scratch paper, see if you can figure out what the molecular formula of the molecule I'm about to show you is. Okay, so there it is. Take a look at that and see if you can tell me what you think the molecular formula is. Take a guess. It, or you ha yes, it has a subscript number after it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Wait, so what'd you say for the carbon? Just just one, right? Okay. So if you're writing those out with the subscript numbers, how would you write it out? Good. Carbon, just a letter, just the C. You got it. That's that's perfectly it. Very good. And so here's my version of it. Here's the molecular formula. Here's just the molecular structure is up here. That's the one that shows the covalent bonds. Molecular formula is here. H2CO3 is the way you pronounce that, right? Uh, now, uh, I think you put it in a different order. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, but remember everything. Everything is here. You can find on the on the on the YouTube channel of the lecture. Um, sure. Okay. So now um, some of you may have gotten it right, but maybe you put it in a different order. Like maybe you wrote O3 H2C, or maybe you wrote C H2O3. What if you put it in a different order? In this class, it doesn't matter. If I'm asking you questions about this on a midterm or a quiz, you can put them in any order you want to. If you take a chemistry class, they, they would teach you a system for putting it in the right order, but that system's kind of complicated. I was actually a chemistry major in college, and I couldn't keep track of this system. So I'm saying in this class, any order you want to put them in it is fine. Let's do another one. That was so much fun. Okay. So here's another molecular structure. See if you can write down the molecular formula for this molecule. What's that? College. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Just, just that means that means that I'm I'm asking you a question that I want you. Oh no, drill. And that just means that I'm asking you a question. Uh, it, it doesn't relate to like the molecular structure, molecular formula. So I'm saying, molecular formulas can be written down in any order you want to. Yeah, that, okay, that's it, yeah, yeah. Does anybody have a guess for this one's molecular formula? I think that's correct. And again, I, I might have put them in a different order. Yeah, okay, I put C3H803, but you're, you're, you get full credit on, on a midterm for that. Very good. Good, yeah, so that molecular formula says there's a molecule and it contains three carbons eight hydrogens and three oxygens, which is the correct answer. Good. So now you know two ways to represent 
molecules, uh, their molecular structure and their molecular formula. Um, now, sometimes when we're talking about molecules, we, we might want to talk about more than one of a molecule. For instance, here, maybe we want to talk about three water molecules. There's a way to include that in the molecular formula. You just put a big number in front of the molecular formula to say how many of those molecules you're talking about. In other words, if you're talking about more than one of a molecule, just write the molecular formula for one of the molecules, like one water molecule is H2O, right? And then just put a big number in front to say how many of those molecules you're talking about. Uh, so don't confuse the big number in front with the subscript numbers. The subscript numbers are always small. They're kind of written lower down. And they come after the atomic symbol, like the, this means two H's, right? Um, the number in front is a bigger number. It's not a subscript. And it's a, it means how many of the molecules there are. So three means three water molecules. Three H2O means three water molecules. OK, so here's a drill for you guys. How would we symbolize those four ammonia molecules? to take a shot at it. Yeah. Again, 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 I put them in slightly different order, but you, you would get full credit for that. Yeah, 4 and H3, right? So just write the molecular formula of one of the molecules, NH3, and then put a big digit in front of it to say how many of that molecule you're talking about. Yeah, so this is represented as 4 NH3 four molecules of ammonia. Awesome. Good. And let me just go on a completely different tangent for a second. I see almost everybody taking notes. I'm really happy about that because, uh, as I said, I think that's the key to doing well in this class or any other class is, is, is take notes, take notes, take notes. OK. Um, well, moving on. Um, so these are some uh, atoms you see here, and I, I put their atomic symbol inside of them, like a chlorine atom and a potassium atom and a sodium atom and a calcium atom and a hydrogen atom. Um, sometimes atoms or molecules can become electrically charged. And you might say, well, how does that happen? Like, does somebody stick them inside a light socket or something like that? No, there are natural processes that can make atoms or molecules electrically charged. When an atom or molecule does get electrically charged, we say it is an ion. Sometimes we say an electrolyte or a salt, but generally we use the term ion. So it just means an electrically, electrically charged atom or molecule. And when an atom or a molecule becomes an ion, we have to indicate that by either putting a little plus or a minus in the upper right-hand corner as a superscript. So. Let me modify these guys. Yes. Yeah, so if it's an ion, it's always got to have a little plus or minus in the upper right-hand corner. And the, the reverse is also true. If you see an atom or a molecule and there is a plus or minus in the upper right-hand corner, it's an ion. It means that it's, it has become electrically charged. Uh, and there, there is positive electricity and there's negative electricity. That's why we have the pluses and minuses. So if you see that the atomic symbol has a plus, then that means it's a positive, positively electrically charged ion. Sodium and potassium and hydrogen are examples of positive electrically charged ions. And if you see a negative, it means it has a ele negative electrical charge. Now, sometimes a, an atom or molecule might have more than one unit of charge. You know, j just, just like a battery might be a 9-volt battery or a 12-volt battery, they can have different amounts of electricity. There can be different amounts of charge on an atom or molecule. So if you see just, the, just a minus or just a plus, that means it has one unit of electrical charge, like one unit of positive electrical charge or one unit of negative electrical charge. But if you see like a 2 plus or a 3 plus or a 2 minus or a 3 minus, it means it has you know, either two or three units of electrical charge. 
Good. Um, so in that box right there in your lecture outlines and right here on this slide, you see some common ionized atoms found in the human body. For instance, the sodium atoms in your body, almost all of them are actually sodium ions. They have a plus charge on them. And likewise, the potassium atoms in your body, all of them are actually potassium ions. They also have a plus charge. Um, and the chloride ions in your body, uh, the chloride atoms in your body are generally negative charge, like you see here. And so that's why I put in your lecture outlines this list of common ions in the body. So I want you to memorize this also. If I say, name some common ions in the body, you can write down some ones from, from this list right here. Sodium uh, in your body is always has plus one charge. And potassium atoms in your body always have a plus one charge. And magnesium and calcium have those plus two charges. And chloride ions always have a negative charge in your body. Uh, and incidentally, these ions are very important for the proper functioning of your body. Just to give one example, if your sodium and potassium ion concentrations are not at their proper levels, your nervous system can go haywire, and that could cause all sorts of problems, potentially even leading to death. Um, now, all of these are atoms that have become ions. It's also possible for a molecule to become an ion. Remember, a molecule is several atoms joined together. And so th th there are three molecule ions that I want you to memorize, because these are also found in the human body, and they're important. Um, one of these important molecular ions in the human body is called hydroxide ion. And it's a molecule made out of one oxygen and one hydrogen. It always has a negative one charge. Um, Another common ion in the body is called phosphate ion, molecular ion called phosphate ion. Each phosphate ion is made out of one phosphorus atom and four oxygen atoms, and it always has a negative three, or usually has a negative three ionic charge. And lastly, there's a molecular ion in the body called bicarbonate ion. Each of those molecules is made out of one hydrogen atom, one carbon atom, and three oxygen atoms. And bicarbonate ion always has a negative one ionic charge to it. Good. Um, now, for some reason, don't ask me why, uh, phosphate ions sometimes get their own symbol different from their molecular formula. Oftentimes, they are shown just as a circle P, a P within a circle. Um, and so when, when you're reading the textbook or looking at the figures in the textbook, or when I'm showing you molecules from inside the body, if you see a circle P, that's what it means. It means phosphate ion, and it means one phosphate molecule, PO4, with a negative three charge on it. Yeah, I don't know why that one gets its own symbol, but it does. All right, uh, so we're, I guess we have 10 minutes left in the, in the period, and we're kind of in the home stretch of the lecture. Maybe I, maybe I can finish this off in the 10 minutes, let's see. OK, so um, here are two molecules. This molecule is made out of two nitrogen atoms bonded together with a covalent bond. And this molecule is made out of two oxygen atoms bonded together as a covalent bond. So those covalent bonds are fairly strong. You know, they, they hold the, the atoms together in the molecule. But they can break. Uh, usually what, uh, what can cause them to break is if two molecules crash into each other, the force of the collision can sometimes break the, uh, the bonds. And you know, that's not unusual. Like if two cars collide with each other, sometimes the, the bonds that keep the fenders and the tires attached to the cars break and, and, and you know, the car parts go out all over the highway and whatnot. So that's going to happen with these two molecules. When I click the button, you're going to see them collide with each other. And when they collide, their covalent bonds are going to break. Well, when atoms break apart from, from a molecule, those atoms sometimes can come back together, but they don't necessarily join onto the same atoms that they broke off from. And so what can sometimes happen is the, the, when atoms collide and the bonds break, the molecules can change atoms with each other. Um, and that's the essence of what's called a chemical reaction. A chemical reaction is when molecules get changed. And when I say molecules get changed, the molecule might get some atoms added to it, 
or the atom or the molecule might lose some some of its atoms, or it might do both. It might lose some of its atoms but gain some other atoms. And it always happens. The chemical reaction always happens when the molecules collide with each other and that breaks some of their covalent bonds. So when I click this button, you'll see it. These guys will collide. These covalent bonds will break, and new covalent bonds will form, and we'll get some changed molecules. So here they come. They collide. Those old bonds broke. Some new bonds form. Um, so notice we still have the same atoms we had before. We had two nitrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms, but the molecules have changed. We now have a molecule made out of a nitrogen connected to an oxygen. We didn't have that molecule before. Right, so that was a chemical reaction because the molecules changed. They gained some atoms. They lost some atoms. But notice the, the actual numbers of atoms didn't change. They were just sort of being rearranged into, into uh, new molecules. OK, well, we're going to be talking about some of the chemical reactions that take place inside the human body. And so we need to have a way of writing down a chemical reaction. And that's what this part of your lecture outline describes. So let me show you that same chemical reaction again, but we'll see how to write down a chemical reaction. OK, so when you're going to write down a chemical reaction, you begin by writing down the molecules that go into the reaction. Those are called the reactants. I said the old molecules, but I should have said the molecules that go into the reaction are the reactants. And so how do you write them? You just write down their molecular formulas. What's the molecular formula for this molecule? N2, right? And what's the molecular formula for this molecule? O2, right? And so just write down the reactant molecules and put a little plus sign between them. I pronounce that as reacts with. I would say N2 reacts with O2. And then to symbolize the molecules colliding with each other and the old bonds breaking and the new bonds forming, you just write an arrow like that, right? So I put an arrow in the middle. And then the, the new molecules that get formed are called the product molecules. So how would I write down the product molecules? What's their, how do I symbolize that as molecular formula? I think I heard it the first correct over here, 2NO. So remember, if you're talking about more than one of a molecule, just write down one molecular formula, NO is the molecular formula, and then put a big, big number in front to say how many of those molecules you're talking about. Good. So this symbolizes, oh, and those are the products. So this symbolizes that chemical reaction, write down the reactant with a little plus between the molecular formulas, an arrow, and then you write down the product molecules. OK, let's do a drill. So let me just show you this chemical reaction, and then we're going to write it down. These molecules collide. We get some new molecules. So molecules have been changed, and so that makes it a chemical reaction, but we have to write it down. OK, so what do I write down for the reactants? I think I, I heard it correctly, right? So you, there's two of these molecules made out of two H's. So just write the molecular formula of one, which is H2, but then put a put, put big digit in front to say I'm talking about two of those H2 molecules. Then write plus, because there's another reactant type of molecule, an O2 molecule like that. Good. How do I symbolize them crashing together? Arrow, good. And what do I write for the product? Perfect, very good. There's two product molecules of water. So you just write down H2O, one water molecule, but put the big two in front to say I'm talking about two of those water molecules. Good. You're getting the hang of it. So anytime you see a thing where there's a bunch of molecular formulas and there's an arrow, know that what the arrow is pointing at is the product molecules. To the left of the arrow are the reactant molecules. And the whole thing is symbolizing a chemical reaction. Uh, hold on, we're not quite done yet. Um, Good. And so those, that chemical reaction I just showed you is a fairly simple one. Uh, you know, um, but the chemical reactions that take place in the human body can be a little bit more complicated than that. Here's a chemical reaction that we're going to be talking about quite a bit this semester. Um, so there's a molecule, and it reacts with these molecules, and it turns into these as the product molecules over here. So if I were to ask you, 
how many total reactant molecules are there? What would be the right answer? There are two types of reactant molecules, but this molecule and this molecule, but how many total reactant molecules are there? Well, how many oxygen molecules are there? How many? Not four. What's the number there? Six, right. So there's six mox, uh, oxygen molecules on the reactant side. And this is actually a type of sugar called glucose. How many molecules is, is that? If there's, no, if there's no number written here, how many molecules is it? It's just one, right? If there's no digit in front, it just means one. So there's one glucose molecule reacting with six oxygen molecules. So what's the grand total of reactant molecules? Six plus one is seven, good. How many product molecules are there? Twelve, right. Six carbon dioxides and six waters. And so notice the number of molecules can change. There are seven reactant molecules turning into 12 product molecules. What cannot change in a chemical reaction? Number of atoms, right. There's just as many carbon atoms on the reactant side as the product, just as many hydrogen atoms as the reactants in the product, and just as many oxygen atoms as the reactant. So yeah, chemical reaction, just the molecules, the atoms are being rearranged, so the number of atoms doesn't change, even though the number of molecules might change. Okay, we, that's perfect. We'll stop there. Thank you very much.